Hello, everyone. My guest today is Rob Heiser. He's the CEO and co-founder of Segment, an innovative te- financial technology company that empowers financial institutions and financial technology providers to easily understand and leverage data, interact with customers, and measure results. He's been awarded seven U.S. and international patents for the company. He's also the founder of Wired Views, a digital marketing agency. Rob, are you ready to take us to the top? Sure, absolutely. All right, Segment. Uh, tell us what it does and uh, and what's your revenue model? How do you guys make money? So, uh, so first what we do is it's a pretty simple business. Um, what we do is we take all the transaction data from institutions that we partner with. So, um, it could be, you know, product data, transaction based data, we take all that in anonymously, um, that data, we then, uh, we have a process in which we cleanse, identify and categorize that data. And then we have applications that help, you know, activate the data. So if we're going to go apply that to maybe messaging that goes into a, a marketing channel or something around understanding a competitors uh, with different reports. We have different billing and pricing models based on different products that we have. Uh, the, the most traditional with, with what most of our customers do is they pay us on a per customer um, per month basis. So basically account holder. Um, and that's for our kind of end to end platform. Uh, we also have uh, models in which they're signing up for an annual report, uh, which they get full reports a year. Or uh, there's another product in which we just cleanse data. And they're paying on like a per per transaction basis. Okay, which line of business is is the largest in terms of revenue? Um, the the end to end the end to end platform. We sell that a lot through different uh, channels. Um, you know, distribution channels, resale partners, that's different different co- companies like that that resell or rebrand our product, white label it. And so that's definitely most of our revenue. And, and Rob, is that a, a traditional SaaS model? It's recurring revenue? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a SaaS business. Okay. Got it. And give me a sense, those customers, I'm sure you have many different cohorts, but on average, what are they paying per year for that? Um, it just depends on the size and the, the effort of the institution. So, um, yeah, we have institutions as small as, you know, two or two or 300 million in assets to institutions that are in the top 50 in the country. And so that just depends on, uh, you know, if it's a business and it's retail, our, our model's not extremely complicated, but each business, each bank is structured differently. If it's a retail bank, if it's an investment bank. So we, we have different, uh, it's, it's hard to give you a direct number based because it's so based on size. I know I, I totally get it, but I'm going to force you here. You're like, what's an average. I mean, are we talking a hundred thousand dollar ACV, 10,000 ACV, a million ACV typically what's a good fit size customer for you? It's, uh, it, it really depends on the, the, the channel partner. I have a channel partner that sells uh, banks that are, you know, 150 billion in assets. I have a channel partner that sells banks that are 100 million in assets. It's and each one of those have their own model. I wholesale it to them. So I, I, I charge them a wholesale price and they, they charge uh, whatever they want to their clients. Yeah, I'm just interested in what you're charging them, not whatever they're charging their clients, which you have no control over. Well, yeah, but. But that exposes what their what their margin is, and I, I wouldn't do that to to my channel partners. Well, no, because I'm not asking for a specific channel partner. I'm asking for an average. You've given a huge range, so it's hard for me to ask really good questions because you basically said we go from nothing to 200 billion under management. Yeah. So if you're looking at like what a, a per cost per month is, I think you're you're depending on what product you're looking at and how much features we're delivering for them. You just can go your SaaS. From like a five cents. Yeah, it's all SaaS based. Well, you just said you had three different business models. One was they're paying for a report annually. One is your end to end thing. And it sounds like you have an agency on the side as well. No, but everything, everything that we're doing is all SaaS based. So the report is all an annual revenue stream and they sign up for one, two or three years. So even though it's not a software delivery, we're delivering PDF that still generates the, the, the actual report, right? So yeah. So so everything I get that. I get that. It's well, I would not consider a PDF delivery a- annually a SaaS product. I'd say it's tech-enabled professional services, right? That, that, and it's generating a PDF report, it sounds okay. like. I'm talking specifically, I want, I want to dig deep into the, the tech, right? Like the software side of your business, just that. So we charge anywhere from like a uh, five to six cents based on what features are using in our product all the way up to 15, 20 cents per month. And that's on a per account basis. And it's also scales based on how many account holders they have. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, w- I won't push harder there. It's, it sounds like you've got it, many, many kind of different pricing models, but get, put this on a timeline for me. So when did you launch this idea? It's been 10 years ago. So we're just, we just re- passed our 10 year anniversary. Okay. So 2008, it sounds like what was launched. Have you bootstrapped the company or have you raised? 
Uh, we raised, we've raised over $30 million. Okay, so you raised 30 million bucks. And why'd you decide to raise? Why not keep bootstrapping? Uh, based on what we had to do, there's a, a significant amount of infrastructure that goes into what we're doing that is integration to either core providers or online banking providers. And that's a pretty significant capital expenditure up front for us to do what we do from a, from a, a technology perspective. And so that integration, both with our staff and sometimes we have to pay kind of connection or implementation fees, uh, at least earlier in the company we did, that was all, that's how, we, that's what we used the funds for. That's interesting. Is that actual, there's nothing hardware related there. It's just fees to basically unlock like channels essentially. Yeah, so there's there's custom integrations that happen on on a lot of these channels, and so when we're young and we don't have we didn't have the 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 customer um, kind of pressure that we could we could create. The beginning of that was we we paid fees to activate channels, we paid fees to activate data. We don't do that anymore. In a lot of cases, we're charging fees to do that. But when you're young, you don't have the the basis of you know a customer base to do that. Then it then it there's things that you have to do to, to make deals happen. Yep. No, I totally get that. I want to dive into deals specifically. So, so 2008, you launched 10 years later today, how many customers are you working with now today? Um, and the user cost, like resellers? No, no, just the people, just the people you're working with, not the people they're working with. Uh, so we have very small amount of direct customers. So we don't, again, we work with channels. So we probably have about a dozen or so institutions that we work with directly, but Beyond that, we have, you know, you know, you know, over 50 institutions. If you're looking at that, if you're looking at through resale partners, uh, based on some of the deals we're cutting now, we're talking about hundreds of institutions. Yeah, I just, I want to make sure I give you credit where credit's due and that my audience understands the numbers you're giving. Sure. I, I just want to know what you are selling your tech to. I know then they then go and sell it to other people and they have their own market margins. You are yeah. directly working with about 12 partners uh, directly. Yeah. So resellers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. Got it. Got it. And they are just to be clear there. Sometimes there are many times white labeling what you've built, marking it up a little bit and then as yeah. a sales channel selling it through. hundred percent. Of correct. which you get, you don't, they have a flat fee that they pay you. They can make up whatever margin they want, right? You don't take anything that they sell their partners. Correct. That's right. Okay. That's great. Very cool. Um, team size today. Where are you guys at? Uh, we have 24 people. Okay, 20, 24. Uh, but by the way, I, I you keep using small like it's a bad thing. You said small customer, small team. I like small. That means more revenue per employee. I love small. Yeah. I like, uh, <laughs> don't get me wrong. All I, right. I like, you I, say I, it so negative. You say it almost like negatively. I just want to make sure no, I like small. It's, it's the family. Are you kidding me? This is, uh, this is, this is the best time. Right? Yeah. All right. So 24 of you guys. And where's everybody based? Everyone in Ohio? Uh, everybody's in the Ohio office. We have one uh, person that's a little bit remote. Okay. And what's the breakdown of that 24 between kind of sales, marketing, engineering? Uh, sales and I'd call it client services. So both inside and outside, inside and outside sales probably makes about uh, eight of them. Uh, rest, the rest is either, you know, we have a CFO, stuff like that. But most of the rest is uh, both uh, engineers, uh, uh, I'll call data or ETL data sciences. And we were very big in terms of library science. Well, you know, the big thing today, you know, you talk a lot about what, what's happening in data sciences. You're taking big data sets that really don't make a whole lot of sense, right? And you're trying to make sense of what that data is by using AI. What we're doing on the library side is we're categorizing all that data. So we're seeing you know, billions of transactions a year. And so we, 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 we see those transactions and we're categorizing them both um, by the technology that we built. But it, it, it always fails down to if we don't understand what that exact transaction means, because this is what the value we bring to, the, to our clients, to our customers, is that we categorize that based on real people, real people looking at it. And so we have what's called these variations of transactions. So if you ever look at your bank statement and you're saying, oh, I, I know this is Target or I know this is Starbucks, but I maybe I don't remember what this one was, right? That description of that merchant, uh, that interaction where you swiped your card or maybe you made a bill pay payment and you don't, you don't exactly remember what that is. Well, we make sense of all that really unstructured data. And so our library scientists, we not only do identify where the data is going, so you know, where the money's going, right? The flow of the money is going to Starbucks. I know they're buying a Starbucks coffee. But in a lot of cases, we know that it's going to an institution. This is why the banks um, like our product so much. We know that it's going to, let's say, a, you know, a, 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 a mortgage lender. 
And we, so we know it's both an institution and it's a mortgage, or we know it's an institution and it's a credit card or a retail credit card or a commercial card. So that's what our technology really does is it, it cleanses the data so that in the, when they take it in for creating models or maybe doing something inside the bank statement or doing something inside their mobile app, that's what I'm delivering to them. And, um, yeah, that, that, that was really helpful to kind of understand that what that means. So when you say library scientists versus like data scientists, what you're saying is they're, they're kind of focused on a specific set. It's not just a bunch of unstructured data all over the place. It's a specific set based off credit card statements and you can predict these pretty accurately. Yeah. We're, I mean, from, from understanding every transaction, that's exactly what we do. We have a term in, inside our business that every, tra- you know, uh, no transactions are left behind because we, we really need to understand what what your where you're spending money and what your life is is about, and it's not it's not, it's not always big transactions either. I mean, I'll give you an example of a small transaction that a bank might look oh like they might you know not think anything about it, but if you see a small transaction to let's say if we're familiar with Robinhood, right? It's a it's an investment app, a self investment. If we see under a dollar, that means that they're che- they're they're connecting your they're account. signing up. You're signing up. And so there, after we see that small transaction, then we see a large transaction of money moving out to Robinhood. And from a bank perspective, once the money moves, it typically doesn't come back. So it gives them a short window to say, you know, are we not delivering? Are we not servicing you? From an investment perspective, what can we do better, right? That conversation is really important. That's a, that's a super interesting use case. And I totally understand it. Um, I could see why banks would want that data. Uh, and, you know, them, Robinhood, Wealthfront, any, any of these new kind of robo-advisors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, very good. Um, talk to me, if you can, kind of about, about size generally. I mean, are you comfortable sharing general revenue size today? Uh, yeah, we are a privately held company. We do not share revenue. I should kind of growth. Um, sure. You know, we, we uh, you know, year over year, we're typically seeing, you know, 60, 50 to 60% growth. This year, we'll be at a, you know, a 50% growth uh, in terms of both uh, onboarding from a, a what we call a unique customer count, so that's what we look. That's the measurement we look at internally. But then we, you know, same thing. We're uh, from a, a transaction perspective. You know, the, the number of total transactions we're seeing on our platform. You know, we're growing at about forty percent year over year. And from an ARR, right? That's what everybody cares about. We're 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 doubling it about that every year. So okay. we're looking at a double from an ARR perspective. That's great. And. Um, are you obviously you've raised, so it would make sense if you're burning cash. But I mean, are you are you break even today? Or are you still burning cash to grow? Uh, we're close. We'll we'll probably break even sometime uh, middle middle to early next year. Okay, middle. Early, okay, that's great. Early 2019. Um, great. Talk to me about acquisition. So so obviously, you have a couple people dedicated to kind of inside outside sales. I don't know if you do any direct spend, but when you look at getting one of these new logos, you have 12 of them today. But when you get a new one, what are you willing to spend mm-hmm. to acquire those guys? Uh, it just depends on the size of their ecosystem. So we we spend a lot of time in terms of both developing the relationships. That's a, an important aspect of this industry. You know, the financial services industry is a very small, especially financial technology. There's only you know so many players in the space, and in creating those strong relationships is important. And so, um, you know, if 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 they have two or three hundred banks as a as a as as their customer base, that's a that's a really critical important relationship for us. So. Um, we'll, we'll go all out. We spend a lot of time uh, building the relationship, traveling and uh, investing in it. And then post, you know, uh, that relationship is, we want to keep that relationship super strong. So it's both investing and co-investing in marketing and go to market with them. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's critical for us to have those relationships and, and the acquisition, uh, you know, it, they're typically long sales cycles for us, but how long? Um, uh, probably from a partner perspective to get all the way from a uh, meeting to, you know, them signing up, it's probably about uh, nine months. Is, okay. Is my guess. Okay. And for, let's just keep going with the example that you gave someone that's a great partner, 300 connected accounts, big value for you. Mm-hmm. What would you be willing to spend to acquire those folks? And maybe don't give it in a hard number, but maybe give it in terms of what you're, what you're willing to wait in terms of payback period. So you'll spend the first month ACV to acquire them or two years of ACV or, yeah, I think I think you know from from what we spend today, I would tell you we're probably spending three to six months, depending on. Uh, and I would say legal is a big part of that. You know, these yeah. are large institutions that a lot of this will go out uh, from our outside counsel, and so these are large agreements. You know, typically when you're talking about compliance, and uh, so it you know that that's a lot of our acquisition costs other than time, and so. 
uh, the, the, the people time is very important. Building out that business case for them is, is very important. So it, it's probably, you know, three to four months in terms of um, the return on our, our direct time. And then outside of that, it's probably another three months just on legal expenses. Yep. That makes sense. And then uh, what, you know, churn's critical in a SaaS business. How do you measure churn today? Uh, what was the question? Churn is critical in any SaaS business. What is your churn today and how do you, what do you measure? Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is the only time that we've t- typically lost a client in, in our space is from acquisition. So um, yeah, obviously it's a, it's a lot of M&As happening in, in banking and financial services. Um, and that's typically, you know, you either win or lose on the M&A transaction for us. And so outside of M&A transactions, we really haven't lost a client. And so um, that's what we really have to get ahead of that. And depending on who's acquiring the bank, uh, or if it's a merger, who's going to be the, the, you know, who's going to be, who's going to win in the end in terms of, uh, the, the leadership of the institution. So Rob, if you look at a number instead, of, instead of just talking about lost customers, I mean, I assume you have upsell revenue, maybe sometimes people downgrade revenue, but you still have them as a customer. So when you look at just revenue churn annually, what is that? Uh, we have typically revenue growth for us is pretty, pretty steady from a, from a per customer basis um, uh, because they're always acquiring, they're always building their bank, right? So you always have two to 3% growth in terms of what they're doing as an institution, um, building accounts, winning new accounts. We help them in terms of strategy. Um, so we have not seen a whole lot of uh, churn in terms of, of, of that perspective from a revenue perspective. It's, it's been mostly growth. Okay. So you've never seen any customers da- downgrade by a dollar. I mean, you have no down, so down, no downgrading revenue lost. No, typically. So we, uh, part of our plan is we have this stage crawl, walk, run within our revenue basis. And, um, typically they graduate up. Um, the only, the only time we lose a customer is a complete loss, which is a merger. Okay. So yeah, just to answer my question directly, that, that would mean you have, you're telling me you have no doubt, no customers ever pay you less one year to the next. They always are paying you more. You never lose revenue. Yes, correct. Okay. Got it. Uh, very good. All right. Let's, uh, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I, I like a lot of them. You know, there's a book that I've been, that I, I read called, uh, it's not a business book and I can't look it up. It's on my, uh, on my phone, but it's called sense making. It's more about data than it is about business. They they wind in business uh, because it's about not only understanding data, but understanding the you know what what goes behind decisions of of the human being, right? And and it's culture and humanities. And I really like by a guy named Christian Madsberg. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, and it really ties in together. It can't just be about data. It's also there's a lot of other things that go into making these decisions. Sense making. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? That's off the map. I don't want like a big time CEO. I want maybe someone in Ohio. Yeah. So I've been following, uh, there's a, a CEO here. His name's Dan Collins. He's got a business called Waste Bits. Um, it's a, it's a business in which they take their, their profiling waste data and, uh, he's, he's blowing up quite a bit. Uh, he, it's a really interesting business in which he's partnering with the waste industry and also looking at different, um, uh, different data elements that probably the industry has never looked at before in a, in an industry that's typically paper-based. And it's, so he's, he's definitely disrupting a, a unique space. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? I love LinkedIn. <laughs> I, I could have guessed that one for you. All right. Number, yeah. f- number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Oh uh, boy. <laughs> it depends on the week, but I would say average five and a half. Okay. That's, that's not a lot actually, Rob. You're killing yourself, man. Uh, I have a, I have a, to be, uh, to be fair, I have a daughter, nine year old who's a type one. Uh, so how many know, kids? I have three, three. Okay. Wow. So married three kids, married three kids. And how old are you? I'm 43, 43. Okay. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh, <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I would tell you that everything takes longer. Everything, everything takes longer than you expect, uh, and it takes it takes a lot. Uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to, uh, especially on a B two B perspective, uh, to really build a brand. Uh, and, you know, uh, having an agency, I've done a lot on a B two C. 
B2B took a lot longer than I ever expected. Guys, it takes longer. Have patience. FinTech company launched 2008 based in Ohio, 24 people. They do something very interesting. Banks will essentially buy their data. And the reason that's compelling is because they'll, they can see in consumer accounts when they just sign up with Robinhood, right? And, and the Robinhood is sending, you know, a 20 cent, like, you know, verify this is your account thing. Rob can pick up on that and quickly tell the bank, hey, they're about to put 10 grand with Robinhood. Call them and try and save them to see what you can do better. Really compelling story. Interesting use case. Rob, thank you so much for taking us to the top. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it.